My name is Jim McHugh. I'm here in the Hazelwood section of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So I'm here at what we call everybody's garden. Everybody's welcome here. Everybody can help. Everybody can share the harvest of. It's uh, like a city park. We hope going to be here and be legally here um, in perpetuity so that we would always be able to uh, have this a little section of um, the city that is owned by us together um, be always here as a park and not turned into a, a parking place or a parking lot or uh, which has happened to um, community gardens in Pittsburgh. One of the reasons we're here is for uh, community. This, this is a stressed neighborhood. We're uh, making great strides and, uh, and um, a lot of struggles, some failures. And um, getting community gardens growing, going in um, the Hazelwood section of the, Pit of the city of Pittsburgh. We are learning to understand each other better and anyone can come here, sit on one of the benches, um, talk, you sing, dance, um, eat, whatever, um, you know, that's the thing is, is w w the, uh, the expertise and the, the, the care for the community that has helped to build this um, and other gardens that we have now in, in Hazelwood. Um, nurturing the greatest variety and quantity of life in an area is what makes an area healthy. I'm more into microbiology than the larger plants and animals. And um, my uh, thing is to, uh, I realize that um, the soil is very similar to our, our stomachs. Some of the same microbes are a necessary part of uh, both our stomachs, our digestive systems, and also of the, um, of the Earth's healthy soils. Everything has a value. And um, the part of the recycling of um, things is going on by the microbes, especially. Permaculture is, in, in a way, it's, uh, it's trying to return to um, <clears throat> go to a new, a new harmony with nature. We've, we've gone out of touch, out of balance with nature, but now we're, there are many of us who are waking, awakening and um, <clears throat> coming back to um, a new harmony with nature. So. I just had a, a, a discussion with a neighbor who um, at times has said that the uh, gardens is just beautiful smells. He, he said, I love the smell. And then just yesterday he told me, he said, you got to take care of this. This is, a, this is terrible. I, he says, I could smell down here. He, he was thinking it was, he said, there's skunks. And, and we know that there are skunks in the neighborhood. There are also raccoons. There are also woodchucks, groundhogs, there, there are rabbits, um, there are mice. These things, there are also hawks and snakes. Not a lot, but these things to some extent are keeping us in balance. So you'll be hearing from um, Matt Peters, also, who's uh, the chair of our urban ag. So it's just basically it's a subcommittee of uh, the Hazelwood Initiative that I helped to uh, found. And um, Matt is a forest protector. That's Matt. He's a, he calls himself a worm whisperer. My name is Matt Peters. I'm the chair of the Hazelwood Urban Agriculture Team. Uh, we're a group of citizens that uh, takes care of gardens like this one. This is a community garden here in the Riverside portion of Hazelwood. Uh, we have a couple other gardens around town. Uh, we also have some private entrepreneurs like myself and uh, there's a guy named Kyle who has a, a farm, you know, providing vegetables uh, for sale. So we're a group of people with um, with a mission. You know, one of the special things about, about this garden here at Elizabeth and Lytle, what Jim calls, we call it everybody's garden. Um, one is that it's, it's just, it's an access point for people who may have never seen where their food comes from to understand tomatoes grow on a plant, you know, apples grow on trees, you know, real basic stuff like that. This garden presents a really unique opportunity to connect individuals, citizens, residents, uh, not only with the source of the food, but also with a little bit of the wild character 
of the region. I think the 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 uh, what they call nature deficit disorder, you know, is a is a is a growing. There's a growing recognition that it's a serious concern in our in our society. You know that that we're so civilized and technology is is uh, taking control of our lives. Um, to the untrained eye, this looks like a weedy mess. But one of the principles of permaculture is that it's that nature. Um, it's, it's more than just working with nature the way you work with clay. It's almost that nature works with us and that we're the clay. Um, so that, you know, when you have a plant that you're cultivating, you know, maybe you're cultivating it for the yellow flowers or maybe you're cultivating it for the nutritious seeds, um, but that you're also cultivating it for the beneficial insects, you know, for the birds. Humans are clever at many things. But the thing that I think that is our true gift to the natural world is making soil. Nature takes a hundred years, you know, to build an inch of topsoil. We can do that in a single season. That's amazing. That's cooler than beaver dams. <laughs> so 250 years ago, this very spot that we were standing on now, uh, this was a Native American village. Uh, this now it's homes, now it's abandoned mill property, you know. Um, but not that very long ago, people lived for hundreds of years, for thousands of years, in a way uh, that was completely in harmony with nature. You know, that so much so that when Europeans arrived here, they called it a wilderness. You know, there was, there was I think, a fundamental misunderstanding about the nature of cultivation, about the nature of, you know, building nature up to what to it to its highest potential. Um, our European modern system of agriculture uh, created the Dust Bowl in the 1930s. It's cost us the monarch butterfly and the passenger pigeon. Um, we're in the middle of one of the biggest extinction events uh, uh, in literally millions of years, you know, unparalleled since the uh, death of the dinosaurs. And a, a very large part of this is, is because of our agricultural system, which is largely based on fossil fuels. You know, we use petrochemical fertilizers, we run the tractors, we plow the soil. You know, it's based on um, disruption, you know, annuals, um, tilling, plowing, fertilizer, you know, one-time application of herbicides and fertilizers, you know, these are all disruptions of the soil. This garden, although it's just a flash in the pan, it's just a small space, um, we're really geared towards continuity. Even though it's just a small site, you know, it's two house sites, two former house locations. The idea is to restore some of that notion of continuity, to restore some of that connection uh, that, that has, which ironically is what allowed us to become what we are today, which is that, that dis disruption or destructive, um, you know, cycle. So Jim, Jim has introduced or reintroduced trees to this garden, you know, in recognition of the, that, that this almost the entire eastern United States was originally forest. Um, the Europeans method of, of agriculture, you know, involves, of course, you know, the first step is clearing that forest. Um, and then um, introducing crops, you know, based on the, with, a, with a one year cycle, you know, but if, if, if you can plant a system based on perennial crops, you know, crops that grow back year after year, um, like trees, for example, uh, then you, you have a, um, a system of production that's based on stability. Uh, and productivity and stability are two great things that, that go together uh, very well. I think companies, corporations call that profit. <laughs> when you can produce steadily over a period of time, um, the, the, the common word is profit, profitability. Um, wheat and grain 
has been, you know, a staple of our diet, you know, for thousands of years. Um, Native Americans grew corn. There were other crops, you know, sunflowers are an indigenous uh, crop, you know, that was the basis of an agricultural system. Recently, there's a place in, in Kansas called the Land Institute, based in Salinas, Kansas. And for 30 or 40 years, they've been working on a perennial grain, a perennial grain, you know, instead of, instead of the disturbance of plowing the soil, you know, the dust bowl and all that, you know, now we have, and it's, it's brand new, it's still experimental, but it's very exciting. You know, it's, it's, it's going to be a tremendous agricultural revolution. If, if we can plant an area with a, with a grass cover like that, um, then you're really talking about building soil. You know, those roots go tremendously deep in the soil. The, our, our American prairies, you know, you go out west and you look at the prairies out west, which is where the Land Institute is located. Um, that was an incredibly productive ecosystem, you know. Vast herds of animals, uh, similar to the African Serengeti, where humans evolved. Um, you know, the, the buffalo, uh, the antelope, you know, the, the American prairies, um, when that was plowed up, uh, that was, that was devastating for, for the, the, the ecology of the continent. Um, we had the Dust Bowl in the 1930s. We had a huge social upheaval associated with that. You know, people lost their homes, people starved. Um, it was a, it was a big deal. Even the stock market crashed. <laughs> <laughs> it even affected the rich people, you know, that's, that's saying something. And um, so the development of, of a perennial grain, it's called Kernza, um, is, is, to me, that's, it's one of the most exciting developments in the last hundred years uh, in modern agriculture. So the, the, the three sisters system of agriculture, elements of which are incorporated here in this garden, um, that was a system of agriculture used by the Native Americans for centuries, for hundreds of years. I suppose you could call it permaculture. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think I think it would qualify. You know, if, if you can do something for several centuries um, without degrading the soil, you know, um, that would count as permaculture. Now they added a lot. You know, that in addition to plant the corn, plant the bean, plant the squash together so that they provide for the needs of, of one another's for each plant. You know, the corn provides the, the structure, you know, so the beans can grow up. The roots of the beans provides the nutrient in the soil. You know, the squash covers everything and provides shade for the ground and, and crowds out the weeds. Um, but there's more to it than that. They also buried a fish. And I, I, I can imagine the 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 the, the spiritual uh, motivations behind that you know in connecting the land with the sea you know recognizing that the borders of the garden don't stop there where the forest begins you know um, modern ecology we, we go even further out west you go out to the Pacific Northwest in the in Oregon and Washington with the big salmon runs you know science is just now beginning to understand the complexity of the relationship between the salmon and the forest and the way that those salmon bring nutrients from far out into the ocean and through the body of the bear takes it deep into the forest, deep into the mountains. So the, the connections, you know, there was, there was um, almost an intuitive sense that we're only now recovering through this long process of reason and science and experimentation and, you know, taking it apart. Um, but that's, you know, we're, we're, we're only recovering what is, what was lost. We're only putting it back together, you know, because we've, we, we accidentally took it apart and threw away half the pieces. <laughs> we're in, a time of, of rapid and accelerating climate change. You know, we're seeing the tropical, or the, uh, the, the uh, what they call the temperate rainforests out west are burning on a massive scale because of, 
of widespread drought, you know, rainforests having drought. Um, hurricanes, you know, it's a normal part of living in the Gulf Coast, but we're seeing stronger and stronger hurricanes because of, of the oceans have absorbed all that heat. That heat is fueling these storms. You know, these connections are increasingly obvious and increasingly beyond debate. You know, the only, the only debate right now is, is denial which is a defense mechanism. You know, that's not a discussion, that's denial. <laughs> it's its own thing. So we really are running out of time. You know, small gardens like this, in and of themselves, may or may not, you know, they're, they, you know we're not gonna stop climate change here on our little half acre of garden, but we might change the minds of the next generation. You know, we might plant seeds in the children who play in the playground across the street, you know, and, and see this garden every day and, and begin to use this garden for their own diet, for their own enjoyment, you know. Poor Jim's always fussing about how the kids, you know, pick, pick the green apples and the unripe tomatoes just to throw at each other. But that's play, you know, that's, that's children playing and learning and beginning to understand, you know, what, what this is all about. They'll grow up and they'll eat a ripe apple from one of these trees someday. And you got a better way to change the world? <laughs> We began here about eight, eight or so years ago. Um, the, the 2008 um, uh, terrible thing economically that happened um, made it clear to many people that you, they could not afford both food and paying their bills, their other bills, their, their medical housing, etc. So. Um, that was a convergence of thought in the city that gardens and I had done farm work and um, people, other people had various aspects of expertise in putting this together and, and so we got um, uh, the garden group going and we had help from the city. The, the reason I'm here is just there's no reason not to be growing food, growing your own food, um, healthier, fresher. Uh, better tasting, good for the soil, all the things we do.